Heavenly Father, we come to you with gratitude and much uh, appreciation for the gift of yes, your Lord. son, Jesus, for the fact that even before we understood anything, even before we knew that we, that we were souls, uh, you had actually uh, created a way out of the sinful condition in which we were going to actually, Lord, fall into because of disobedience. And you have mercy. And we appreciate the fact that, uh, like the song says, uh, light came, up, came at last. Uh, praise God. I see that light. Lord, we are thankful for supplying needs, for protection, for giving us strength, uh, for giving us the energy, uh, not only physically, but mentally emotionally uh, to face the challenge yes. of every day. Uh, Lord, many times we don't know what we're going to face and uh, we need to be prepared. Sometimes we don't even know how to prepare ourselves because we don't know what's coming. But you are there uh, in those moments to help us. And what to say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your mercy. Be with us, with us in this class as we study that some of this truth, Lord, will be able to take root in the hearts uh, of those that are going to be studying uh, with me uh, some of the scriptures, Lord. We thank you for those who are present and for those that probably will connect later. In Christ the Lord we ask. Amen. Amen. All right. I, like I said, for those who didn't hear it, uh, at the point of this Bible study, we are actually, we have dealt already or we are dealing with 2000 uh 2000 approximately 2700 years of history okay so by this time a lot of things had happened around the world things that we didn't even know okay a lot of things that we didn't know and uh and i'm going to, just to say this don't quote me okay on this i'm going to say don't quote me, uh, but it's, it's interesting. 2,000 years after creation, the flood came. 2,000 after the flood, approximately, Jesus Christ was born. Now we have reached about, because the calendar changes a little bit, over 2,000 years of Christ's first coming. Uh, what I'm trying to get across to you is that we are nearing uh, the end or the possibility of something that uh, is bigger than what we even think or realize. That's just uh, history and just, I'm just sharing it with you. Uh, now, I'm going to jump to Genesis 18. And I believe that there are some lessons there to be learned. And perhaps there are some things there that you uh, never noticed before or you don't realize they were there. And why it's important for us to know that they are there and what they mean to you and me today. Um, before we reach uh, this uh, situation uh, in Genesis 18, and that's what we're going to start tonight. Uh, I want to ask you a question. Because we're going to be dealing a little bit with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, a topic that uh, sometimes is misunderstood. Uh, because people just don't read the Bible through or meditate or do research. They just read it and they come to crazy conclusions. So uh, in chapter 19 of Genesis, we find the destruction of Sodom and, and Gomorrah. And at the same time, I want to uh, call your attention that uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were not the only one that were destroyed. Uh, in case that you uh, have never paid attention to, uh, to that. Um, the Bible says that um, in verse 24, 
19. This is not what we're going to study, but I just want to bring this up to you. And verse 24, it says, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah were two cities. Okay? There were two cities. It's not that the city was called Sodom and Gomorrah. Two cities that were hooked together practically. And the Bible says that uh, it rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Just think about these things falling from heaven. And definitely it was not like rain. It says rain, but it means they was falling down. Probably big balls of fire with the uh, brimstone. And the Bible says, and he overthrew, which means he destroyed those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And I would say, please underline that. But that's very important because if you don't underline that and you read this, you will not be able to make a connection. Because the question that I would well, ask you, well, when well, this happen? I'm talking about verse 27. Where was okay. Abraham before the Lord? What is he talking about? Okay, and um, the Bible says, and he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain and beheld, lo, the smoke of the country went up as a smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of, of the overthrow in the midst of the destruction. They were running in the midst of all the destruction. It's like if, like if bombs were falling. And through all that, the angels led Lot and his family. And um, so we need to understand that something happened here. Okay? Because not only Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, but other cities that were around in the plain were destroyed too. This is a good lesson. When we are close to something that we should not be close to, you can get hurt, right? Because those cities, the judgment is always Sodom and Gomorrah, but they were so close to Sodom and Gomorrah that they got hurt and they were destroyed too. So this is just a lesson. That's how we learn a lesson from the Word of God. Now, we come back to uh, the 18th chapter. And, this, and, and says, and the Lord appeared unto him in the place of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. Remember, they had tents. Now, just to help you a little bit, and I'm, I'm going to actually tell you that it would be good for you if you buy a book that speaks and teaches the customs of the Bible. It must be suffocating to live in a tent. But these tents were the kinds of tents that during the day, all that it did, would, it would cover your, the heads of the people that live in there. And uh, the, the, the surrounding of the tent would be lifted, up, lifted so that the air would circulate. And on top of that, they would put rugs on the ground. Okay, so they were not living on dirt. So I'm just trying to help you to use your imagination that you understand why, why Abraham, it was so, so hot. That the Bible says that he uh, was sitting in this particular place. Uh, then he lifted up his eyes and he saw what? Are you following me? Or you allow me to face all those scriptures by myself? I want you to use your Bible because this is what you're going to learn. Three men. It's all three men. Three men. 
what does verse one says? You mean uh, from chapter 18 or 19? Yes, 18. I'm on 18. 18. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of... Okay, the Lord... Listen now. This is why you have to be very... This is why you cannot be reading the Bible at 12 o'clock at night when you're falling asleep. That's why you have to choose a time during the day in which your mind is clearer. Okay, whatever the day... Or whatever time of the day that's for you. Oh, the Lord appeared. Okay, so where are you, Lord? Lord, where are you? And he lifted up and looked, and behold, three men. Is that what it says? Okay. Uh, that stood by him. Wow. He saw three men. Did he see him? Because I haven't heard this. He was there, there and he saw them from far away. No, he saw three men and all of a sudden the three men were right there in front of him. Okay. And the three men stood by him and when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Okay. So as these three men appear so close to him, the Bible says that he run, but it doesn't mean that he actually run. He may haste. You know, he didn't walk like an old man. He, uh, he, just, he just hurried in the way that he was walking. And, uh, and he said to the three men, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away. I pray thee from thy servant. Three men. And he referred it to the three men. Like what? The Lord. Is that right? He didn't say you three. Are you getting what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm trying to get at? Reference to the Trinity? You could make uh, a suggestion that I will not deny it, but that at, same, at the same time, we don't believe that Jesus made any visitation down on earth until he came and he was born. But don't pass it uh, because God is sovereign and he necessarily didn't have to appear with a human body like he did when he. Uh, when he was born, because he had to be born to be part of uh, what he was going to be, the Messiah. Question, Brother Alex. Yes, sir. So the three men, because I didn't read down the rest of the verses, um, does it describe how they look? That's what he saw. Just three men, but how, how do they look? Well, the Bible doesn't say they were nice looking or if they had a hood over their heads. We there were three men there. We know enough to know that they, look, they were not late, three late. So there were three men. They were distinguished in dress. Which means that even in those days, men and women did not dress the same way, even though it would give you the, you know, you see them sometimes with robes. And you say, right. no, but back in the old days, it was unisex. No, it wasn't. You can still distinct one from the other. Definitely. And that's why I said, try to get a book on the Bible custom. So you know the different pieces of garment that a man use and the pieces mm. of garment that a woman use. Now, uh, and he said, my Lord is now, I have, if I have found grace or favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee from thy servant. Let a little water I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and raise yourself under the tree. So he invites them not to enter into the tent, but to rest under a tree. That's probably a good place to pitch your tent close to a tree. You get some shade, you get some 
uh, air. That's what you would do, right? And uh, he said, I'm going to fetch some water so that you can wash your feet. That was one of the customs uh, back in those days. Since people travel all the time and they use sandals, they didn't have Nikes in those days. Uh, they didn't have a cushion uh, soles shoes. It was, what was that? They didn't have memory foam. <laughs> no, they don't have none of that. So it was hard walking. Um, I would like to see Walter and I would like to see who is Karina? Uh, Claudia. Claudia. Don't hide from me. I need to see you. Ooh, there, Walter. I only can see your eyes. Um, there you are. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to tell nobody. Uh, uh -huh. This is between you and me only. So what happens here is that it was the customary thing to do is to bring uh, something with water and they will wash their tire feet, taking off their sandals, and they will wipe themselves, okay? Now, the Bible says that Abraham placed the host perfectly. Not only that, but uh, he says, I will fetch a morsel of bread. A morsel, but it was more than a morsel. And comfort ye your hearts. When you eat, you get happy, don't you? He's talking about comfort. That's what food does to you. Okay? The only time that you you get happy is when you know you're going to eat. I'm not saying that's the only time in your life. What I'm saying is, uh, if you are hungry and there's no food around, you can become a little bit grouchy and a little bit, uh, you know, that's why sometimes husbands come home and say, where's the food? What do you cook? What? And you go lifting up tops and finding out what is there. But it says, you're going to be comforted. You're going to be uh, happy. You feel, you're going to feel good. All right. It says that your heart may be comforted. After that, you shall pass on. Later on, you keep your traveling. For therefore, are ye come to your servant? And they say, so do. In other words, okay, as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent and to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal. Need it. No, go to the store and get to go to Win Dixie and get some bread, bring it. No, no, no. You have to knead it. Get your elbows on there. And start getting that, you know, that bread. Make bread. Make it hasty. Oh, sisters, you have it good, don't you? And the Bible says, I said, you're going very slow. Yes, I am, because I want to savor this. And the Bible says, um, make three measures of, of, of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the earth. That makes cakes upon, you know what earth is? No earth. It's like come a, on, come on, similar to a stove. What is? What is it? Similar to a to a stove or grill. Yeah, it's, it's something close to a stove uh, made of uh, clay or made of stone. Yeah, I mean. Like they are doing it even today. I have seen that being done in Guatemala and in Mexico too. When they put it on, they throw those tortillas on this, uh, this big round uh, thing of uh, stone. And uh, let me tell you, those tortillas taste much better that, that way than the ones that you buy in, uh, in Walmart. Don't you, Jesus? Or all these. <laughs> or all these. <laughs> they are 
they also use that a lot in the in the Middle East. Um, they do too. Yes. Yeah. The, the only thing that the Middle East they're long, they're big like this. Yeah. They rip big. they rip them apart like that. Oh yeah. I, yeah. In Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, they. Okay. They, yeah, they do. They do. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So the Bible says that. He ran to the herd and fetched a calf, a tender calf, and good, and gave it unto the, a young man, and he hasted to dress it, cook it now. No pressure cooker. Cook it now. Okay, so we have Sarah preparing the bread. Then we have the servants. It doesn't mean that the servant was going to do it by himself. He was a young man, so I don't think he was a cook. But he says, here is dress it. In other words, take it to the people who know how to handle these things and dress it, okay? And, or fix it, prepare it. Uh, then the Bible says that he took butter and he took milk and the, and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. He said, I'm gonna get you a morsel. Oh, this sounds more like a dinner, doesn't it? Especially if you're not hungry. And the Bible says that and they said unto him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, behold, in the tent. And he said, Oh, wow. There were three. And what did we read here? There was one. And he said, do you see anything there? I mean, is anything that's in your mind? Huh? Come on, help me out here. You mean in verse 10? You see anything weird? Yeah, something strange. Uh, there, there's something that uh, makes you think, what is going on here? There's three men, and what? the Bible says, and he said. Mm. I, I will return unto them according to the time of life. Uh huh. I think that's interesting. What happens Crazy. here is. And I'm going to go right here and jump in, in there and tell you. Mm. Uh, one of them, one of them represented personally God himself. Because the Bible says, and you're going to keep reading and then you're going to find out that that's what happened. Okay, the Bible says, uh, and they said, Unto him, where is Sarah? They said. Ah. And he said, behold, in the tent. And he said. They say. He said. Have you ever noticed that in the word of God? Sister Cooper? That's why you need to be in the class. <laughs> Very true. Uh, the Bible says. Where is Sarah? And he said, I will certainly return unto you according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were what? Old and well stricken in age. And he ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So they didn't have, Sarah didn't have any more the time or the month the women usually have when they still can have a child. All right. And Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am wax old, after I am an old woman, I'm going to have pleasure. My Lord being also old, so she's throwing Abraham under the bus too. 
Okay, confess you that you are old. Don't throw the old man inside there. Like it, it's old too. Okay, keep that in mind because you're going to read something later that's going to blow up your mind. Okay, uh, of course, in a symbolic way. Um, and the Lord said unto Abraham, and the Lord said, and the Lord said, and the Lord said, three, one, they said, he said, and the Lord said. Now we are getting closer to this revelation. And said unto Abraham, Where, wherefore, why this hour laugh, saying, shall I of a surely bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? The Lord's still speaking here. Is anything too hard for the Lord? This question is like an echo on the halls of eternity. Remember always this. Is this too hard for the Lord? Is this situation of mine? Is this whatever it might be? Is this too hard for him? Not possible. Hard. Does he have to make an effort? What did Jesus say? With my finger, I cast out the devils. Imagine if I use my whole hand. Okay. Uh, then Sarah denied. Denied. She lied, saying, I laugh not. You're dealing with God. For she was afraid. And he said, nay, but you did laugh. Oh. Now, verse 16. And the man rose up from thence. We go back to the tree again. It's getting good all the time. Listen to this. The three men get up. The Lord said whatever he said. So I didn't, came, I didn't come here to converse with him. When God is going to speak, he speaks his peace and he goes away. That's why he's not talking to you all the time. He said what he had to say. Now keep it in your mind. Because there are people that need. There's a, there's, there, there are people and I have met them through my life that they have a leak. They have a leak. You tell them, I love you. And you have to keep saying, I love you. And I love you. And I love you. Because if you don't say it every hour or every day, they begin to doubt that you really love it. They have a leak, emotional leak. Hmm. Uh, how many times do you meet that? It's, it's like this man that told his wife, did I tell you today that I love you? He said, no. I said, good. <clears throat> but anyway. And the man rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. Why? This was a custom. It was a custom, even today. It's not like we do today. Let us be, okay, real. In most cases, perhaps the Latin people are a little bit more different, but in most cases, when you have visitors in your house and they leave your house, well, goodbye, you close the door and you go back, right? No, here, back in the old days, they will go out and stay with you until they left in their car or they left down the street. Because I remember those days. Any of you remember those days? Yeah. Today, before they are in their cars, you're already turning off the lights outside. <laughs> they can't wait for you to just go home. In other words, if you have any way, any thought of coming back, the lights are off already. <laughs> so keep walking. I'm telling you reality. 
It sounds funny, but it's the reality of our society. Okay? So the custom in those days was to follow the people for a stretch of, of, of you know, I don't know how many feet or maybe a quarter of a mile or one eighth of a mile. And even the Eskimos practice this. You know that it takes about three days for the Eskimos to say goodbye. Here are the Eskimos that have traveled through that snow and their and whatever they're traveling in, and then they go to see their family they haven't seen for a year or two years, and they visit there for maybe three or four days. I don't know how they feel in those uh, eye glues, everybody in there, but anyway, they do. And um, and of course, they don't take bath, you know, because they rub uh, um, grease on top of all their bodies so that they can face the cold. So I wouldn't even like to visit one. <laughs> but the thing is that when their visit is over, when their visit is over, okay, they go out. Family, the host, <laughs> the host, but the his wife and the children, they go out with the family that came and they go out and they begin to talk and say the goodbyes. And the goodbyes are long. Just like saying hello in Eastern days, back in the old days, it took a lot of time. That's why Jesus said, do you remember when Jesus told the disciples, as you go on your way, don't stop and say hello to nobody? You remember hearing that? You know why? Because a hello or a salutation, man, let us sit down and let us make some tea. And let us share some nuts and some figs and maybe some bread. And maybe they will sit there for about an hour or two hours. So Jesus said, this is a, something that had to be done. So don't stop. Don't go and say hello to nobody. Keep walking. Eskimos this is when they are living in the morning. They begin to talk and talk and talk and talk. And the time is passing. And the afternoon comes. And it's about time for lunch. You say, let's have a bite. And then you leave. And then they go back inside. And then uh, the afternoon, they keep talking and talking and talking. And then finally, it's so dark. It's too late. Come back and you live in the morning again. And they do this for about three days. Uh -huh. And fin finally, after three days, they got tired of this hugging and kissing and rubbing noses, whatever they do, and they leave and they go. That's a different cultures, okay? So uh, in this case, Abraham does what it was expected of him as a host. He goes with them. And the Bible says here in verse 17, he left with three, isn't that right? Now we come to verse 17, and the Lord said, again, the Lord speaks. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, or that that he was planning on doing? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessing him. God is asking this question to himself. For I know him. Wow, that's a big one. For I know him. Does he know you? We hear a lot about, I know God, and I know God, and I know God. What about God knowing you? You remember when Matthew 6 says, I never knew you? You said that you knew me, and you cast devils in my name, and you did all this sign, but really, I never knew you. Who are you? Which is a good point that not everybody who does so-called signs and wonders is a person that is sent from God because the devil can do signs and wonders just like uh, the magicians did it in front of Pharaoh, Pharaoh uh, and, uh, and Moses. They copy about three or four of the plates. So uh, he says, I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. 
God was convinced that Abraham would actually be faithful to him. I know that he's going to teach this to his children and to his grandchildren, that he's going to be faithful in justice and judgment. And the Bible says, and the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous, I will help me out. This is a class, I want you to participate. I will come down now. I will come down. I will come down. Did he come down? I think he came, but not him, like God, like he, um, like it's like, it's like we were talking about the men who happen to be, you know, a representation. I think a representation of God, but not God himself, right? Okay, he said, I will come down, right? And uh, so what happened here? Um, verse 19, chapter 19, verse 1. What does it say? And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face towards the ground. Okay, two. Now we're talking about two. Three, one, two. You following this? Okay, so two angels representing God himself go down to Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot is where? Where is Lot? At the gate. Of Why was he at the gate? This is where history comes important. And this is where a lot of things need to be put together so you can have a real idea of the reason why the scriptures say what they say. Sitting at the gate of a city meant that you were a person very important, particularly a judge. It was not that he was sitting on top of the wall like, uh, <laughs> what's the name of the egg that came down and broke himself to pieces? Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty. How do you call it? Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty. Humpty, okay. He was not sitting there on the wall. He, there was a place in the wall that served like an office, if you want to call it that, <clears throat> where certain important people representing the city were there to judge situations, okay? And Lot saw them, and the Bible says that he rose up to meet him. He, he was part of the uh, welcome committee, okay? And he said that he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, behold now, my Lord's, Turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house and tarry all night. So he, take him, he takes them to his house. And we are not going to study this because it's long. And I think that most of you have heard the story. And if you haven't heard the story, this is better than Netflix. And you know why? Because this is true. And uh, the scripture said that the, these two angels, looking like men, went into the city. And uh, the story ends pretty bad because the men of the city surround this, the house of Lot. And they told Lot, bring those men out. We want to meet them. Meeting them means we want to have, we want to have in sexual intimacy with them because most of them were homosexuals. That's what the word meet means. And Adam met his wife and bare him a son. And so and so met his wife 
That's the word that was used all the time. And this is what I imply in here. And Lot says, no, I have two daughters that are virgins. Take them. They took, they took so seriously being a host that they would not allow nothing to happen to this visit. And Lot was willing to give his two daughters that were virgins in order that they would no harm this man. And Lot, which it will surprise a lot of you. And I was talking to somebody and I asked him, how many children did Lot have? Oh, two daughters. I said, no, you missed it. Lot had several children. Where's that in the Bible? Well, go ahead and read it carefully. Because the ones that make fun of Lot were his sons-in-law. And when the angels took Lot out, he said, go and tell your, your son-in-laws and your daughters to come, and they would not come. But these are the two that were in the house. Left. Price? Emana Loima, do you know that? Do you know that? No. Okay, so you learned something tonight. Sister Cooper, do you know that? That's because you heard yes, it in the sir. class. Things. No, no, I knew. Okay. <laughs> All right, so this is what happens here. Finally, the angel says that the city, the cities are going to be destroyed by the Lord. And they, Lord, took his time and uh, concerned about this and uh, concerned about that. Finally, the angel had to take him by the hand and take him out of the city. And the Bible says that it rained uh, brimstone. And uh, the Bible says that salt blew up all over the place. Why? Because this area is close to the Black Sea. And that's where the Dead Sea is. Another class of history. You know why they call it the Dead Sea? It's not because it died. It's because this sea called the Dead Sea is so salty that cannot sustain fish to live in there. And we have, you remember, uh, some of you, uh, of course you remember, it's the Rosa and Brother Antonio. They were there. And they say that they got in the water and they floated. They didn't know how to swim. Because the water was so salty that you would not go down because of the salt. Uh, now, why the, the, oh, okay, the angel said, don't look back. But Loti, that's what I called her one time when I was preaching, Mrs. Loti, that had left the other daughters and uh, he be her beautiful house since Lot was a judge and whatever it is, was going to lose it all. She looked back. I was going to say something, but no, I'm not going to because I don't want to offend any women. So she looked back and she became a what? A pillar of salt. Why? Salt fell from heaven with the explosions of so much deposit of salt that was in those, that area. And today, according to the archaeologist findings, in that area, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pillars of salt. I wonder if one of them is Lot's wife. And this is a fact. I'm not trying to exaggerate here and becoming dramatic. But now, God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Why? James Mendoza, are you listening to me or you're watching something else? 
You were watching the Marlins, weren't you? Listen. Why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, son? We saw so much sin huh? in there. That's why I believe he destroyed it. Are you talking? Because I don't, I don't see your mouth. Oh. Why do you think that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? I, I didn't understand what you were saying. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, better. Okay. Uh, I believe uh, there was so much sin and abomination in there. Okay. That's good. Yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, general, a general answer. You have to wait for something wrong or bad. Uh, somebody can be more specific. Brother David Benavides, why? I believe that uh, there is a section I was trying to look for it now. If my mind do not be failing me, that it says that their sin reached heaven. Meaning yeah. that everything that we're doing in that area there have gotten so nasty before God's eyes that that's the reason God decided to destroy that area. That does not mean that all the areas were not bad, but this area was like fuming in, in, in sin in that area. Okay. Definitely it was something because it was wrong. But you know what the because. Bible says in the book of Ezekiel chapter 16? Oh. It was not just because they were homosexuals. It was because they were lazy. Ooh, watch it. Lazy? Yes, sir. Lazy, fullness of bread. They got so corrupted. They were not thankful. Their stomachs were full. They didn't have time for God. And in chapter 16, as Ezekiel is talking about what was happening uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, the Bible speaks about that that was their sin, the main sin why God destroyed them. And you can look it up, your Bible in Ezekiel chapter 16. I didn't underline it because it's a big chapter here, but let me see if I can find it real fast. Uh, uh, let me see. Oh, yeah, thank God. Verse 49. Ezekiel 16, 49. Behold, look, watch. This was the iniquity. This was the sin of your sister Sodom. Pride. Fullness of bread. And abundances, abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither they care about nobody. Neither did they strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. Totally given to selfishness. Me, me, and me, and me. No a word about homosexuality. Because I am tired of hearing all the time that Sodom and Gomorrah, God destroyed them because of the, the, because they were homosexual. Yes, homosexuality is a sin, very offensive to God. But that's not the reason why it destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. Here is very clear. No wonder with all these uh, things in their hearts and in their life that they gave themselves to this perversion. which shows us that many in the world today that reach that point in their lives is because they have been failing in so many other ways that God turned them over through their own desires and to their own, and, and, and to their own perversions. So I thought that I will give you that just to think about because these are things that sometimes we don't know, we don't hear, nobody mentions it. Right? And then we try to uh, uh, picture that homosexuality is one of the worst sins in the world. 
No, necessarily. It's sin and people will go to hell because of it, but that's not the point here. So it's adultery. So it's liars. So it's unbelief. But I want to make it clear because I believe since I'm giving you this class, it's my responsibility to show you and to help you and to clarify certain concepts that sometimes we think that we understand what it is or it's because of this and then you find, oh wow, it is not what I thought. And the Bible says, thou shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. That's why it's important to know the truth. Okay, so we'll end up with this thought. So we find Lot and his two daughters, very young. And they find refuge. They found refuge in a cave. They thought that the, whole, the world had ended. They didn't have no idea there were other cities. And they go into the cave and this is to show you the perversions that were in that city. They were thinking about themselves and they talk among themselves, the two girls. And they say, let us give wine to our father. And then you go to his bed tonight and have intimacy, sex with him. And then I do it the next night and let us get him drunk. And they did. And both of them got pregnant. Now, hold yourself. Are you holding yourself to your seat? What would happen if Lot's wife had obeyed the command of God and she would have made it? Do you think that this would have happened? See? The Bible says that nobody lives for himself and nobody dies to himself by himself. What we do in life will touch other people's life. She's really guilty before God. Not because she looked back, she disobeyed. But if she had been a mother, she would have protected those daughters from committing incest. And on top of that, they gave birth to those two children. And you know that those two children became two nations, the Ammonites. And those nations were the most terrible enemies that Israel ever had. As you read the history. So this is the reason why I want to bring these classes. Because there's a lot of things that don't make sense. And uh, there's so many things that we think that we know, that we understand right. But in the midst of all this, and we're going to have one more class after this, and we will come to the end of Abraham's life because there's so much on it, uh, that we need to understand where all this Israel is coming from, all these things that took place, how active was God in the midst of that to preserve, to preserve. And another thing that I want to say and I cannot let it go. I had to say it. You know, Abraham and Lot had an argument because both of them had become very rich. And the, the shepherds of Lot and the shepherds of Abraham began to fight because their sheep were mixing together and they were getting into the water and all that kind of stuff. So uh, there was such a quarrel. And Abraham saw that and said, no, 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 this cannot go on. And he called Lot that says, we need to go different ways. So he took him to a hill and told Lot, decide where you want to go. Wherever you go, I will go the other way. And the Bible says that Lot saw the area of Sodom and Gomorrah. Beautiful land, very fertile for sheep, rivers, lakes, all kinds of stuff. And this selfish nephew, instead of saying, no, sir, 
you are the older one. You brought me up to here. I have become rich because of you. You choose where you want to be. Selfish people are that way. And he chose the best land for him. After he chose land, Abraham stayed in his little hill and God appeared to him and said, Abraham, look to the west, look to the east, look to the north, and look to the south. Everything is yours, including what Lord chose. You see, when you stay with God, it's not in vain. You are going to get paid. It's worth it to serve God because he's keeping his eyes on you. And only he will do for you the best for your life. Don't compare your life to somebody else. Don't envy what somebody else has. He has it. Why I don't have it? Number one. Maybe he can handle it. Maybe you cannot handle it. So as we look at these things, learn this. Stay with God. Young people, stay with God. Stay saved. Because at the end, there's a destruction coming. And everything is going to be gone. And not necessarily you have to be destroyed. Inside Sodom and Gomorrah, you can be destroyed outside like it happened to Lot's wife. Okay, I'm through. Any question that you want to ask me? This is the moment so we can close. I hope that you I, learned something. I did want to um, ask something. Uh, um, let me see if I can remember how I want to ask it. Um, I think we were reading or you made emphasis on uh, the power of God. Like, is it too much for him to handle or something like that that we read is it too hard? too hard for him. okay so i was thinking as soon as you as soon as we read that and, and emphasized that is this whole coronavirus heist too much for god to handle no it's not I've, obviously not right um why god, as, god why god allows it well, God has allowed it like he allowed it so many others in the past. Yellow fever, the Black Death. Right. The, the many others that wiped out uh, so many towns in Africa because of, um, remember, uh, when the situation that came because of the, uh, what was the, the name of the, uh, the sickness that began to spread among people that were practicing homosexuality. AIDS. 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 Yeah, a lot of a lot of people don't know that whole cities were wiped out in Africa. So my, why that allows it? Because we live in a cursed world. My That's my 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 real concern or question is: we are blessed and informed to know, and even experience God's uh, power. Um, and what he's capable of doing. Um, and I think everyone has their own experience or their own story of that. My real concern and question is, as is people and being informed and knowing this and knowing that nothing's too hard for, for God, why do we in a way tremble about it? Why are we in fear or wear these masks? I, I think it's, it's you know, man-made stuff that it's constraining us. Um, if this is what we're reading and believing, I, I think that the Holy Spirit is above that uh, or above that sickness, um, not, not to underestimate what a virus can do or sickness can do. But I think I, I, it's just a question and something I have been thinking about. We're like in the middle of this heist. I call it a heist, you know, a man-made heist, uh, a, a man-made chemical or bio, thing created to to scare us and put fear in us and us being informed and knowing the, the bible and knowing god's power um in a way why do we act the opposite if well, we do uh, what happens here is 
that, uh, and something that we must understand that there are certain things in the world that have to take its course. And uh, number two, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So I know that God can protect me from a truck running over me, but I'm not going to cross the street with my eyes closed. Uh, what I'm trying to say with this is that uh, there's a lot of things that God is not going to protect us from. It's no guarantee. We live in a cursed world. If not, Christian people will never die. Uh, they will never get sick. Uh, my parents will have never died when they did. Uh, and there's a lot of things that happen. The reason why uh, this is being polit politicized and a lot of things are being uh, said, different opinions and different things, uh, the fact remains, because I talk to Cuba almost every day and people are dying like flies. It's not that they are being afraid. In fact, they are not, they don't, they don't even have uh, a, a real, uh, uh, how you call it, um, vaccine. So these things are happening. In India, a lot of people are dying. This is not a story. It is happening. Now, it's too hard for God. Uh, does that mean that uh, because we serve God and God loves us, that he promises that uh, we are not going to get sick and we are not going to die? Uh, well, no, no. Because if, if we uh, keep uh, believing that because nothing is too hard for God, God is going to keep us, uh, it's not going to work. Number one, if you don't work, you're going to die of hunger, son, because nobody's going to give you money. Can God supply food? Yes, he can. But the Bible says, if you don't work, don't eat. So what I'm trying to say here is that God has given us uh, something is called, called uh, common sense. And if there's something that you can do to protect yourself from people, not necessarily COVID, there's some, so many other diseases and sicknesses that are going around in the world today that uh, God can protect us, that some Christians are afraid of, of, of getting it. Uh, yes, it could be because I don't wanna go to heaven sick. I believe that I can go to heaven healthy. That's well, the and, first. And, 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 well, that, that, that one's the first, I haven't heard that. <laughs> well, and it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that I'm not gonna die from a disease. I may die better. Right, right, anything, anything can happen. So, Okay, I am a diabetic. I take care of myself. And God keep me uh, from having to take medicine for my day. I, I, don't, I don't use insulin, and God never had. But this is the point. If I'm going to say, well, I'm not afraid. I'm not going to take uh, anything for it. I'm going to trust God because uh, um, I'm not afraid. Uh, I guarantee you in about three months, I'm going to be dead. dead. And I would tempt God because of it. So there's a lot of things that we can actually discuss this. We have gone over about 15 minutes, but we can go back again uh, to bring uh, some of the thoughts concerning some of these things. I appreciate your interest and your input because there's questions that need to be asked and questions that we even have in our head and in our minds. Right. What happened I, to I, our children? How protected are we? Um, it was more, and, and I'm... I appreciate that answer. Um, it gives me a, good, a better balance of perspective. I'm also saying that of living in fear as Christians or being informed, not being necessarily naive to say that God is just going to save us from everything and anything just because we are on this side of the fence. But the word faith just keeps popping up in my head and what, what it really means to trust and believe that you know, God does has his hand over us and he and 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 we're yes. still having common sense within the at, at the that. same time, son. Let me let me tell you this. Having faith in God is one thing. Now, having faith for a specific thing, you better be convicted in your heart that God is gonna keep you, you're gonna die. And I have I have a I have a two paralysis in my face. And then there are some witnesses that saw it when it happened to me. I had double vision uh, because something that happened and my faith was, I had all my mouth chew up, bleeding, 
because paralyzed completely. I don't come close. And uh, there's witnesses here. When this happened, and some of the saints in the church, they did cry when they saw me. I couldn't preach or anything. And uh, after two weeks, after two weeks, God talked to me. And I say this with conviction because I know when God speaks to your heart, I didn't hear nothing. In which I felt that I had to become responsible with my own words. I got up in a prayer meeting and I had to lift up my cheek like this because I couldn't speak. And I say, I want you to please quit praying for me. Don't pray anymore. Don't fast for me. I know that God is going to heal me. He already told me that. And two days later, I felt like an electric shock, like this. And God healed me. But you cannot do that unless you have the conviction of faith to receive that type of healing. Okay? And it happened again. And the same thing happened. So what I'm saying is, yes, I have faith. But in that moment, a lot of things can happen. And it's not that you don't have faith in God. It's just that you don't want to be, uh, you know, there are some uh, saints in the church. I know they have faith in God. It didn't happen to them. And they still, after years, they have their faith. And some of you here know that. Too. So it is a deep subject. Maybe one day we'll have a discussion. There. Yeah, that's Thank something you. Something definitely, uh, I'm pretty sure everyone has an input on that one. So yeah, something good to discuss. Yeah, we can talk about it. Thank let's you. bow our heads and let's have uh, uh, a prayer. I'm sorry that it took so long. I Maybe you go to sleep early. Go in some places. It's earlier than this. Anyway, uh, let's have prayer. And um, uh, Brother Alejandro. Yeah, dear Heavenly Father, I want to take this time, Lord, to thank you so much for this class that you've you've given us with Brother Alex, um, and how much we're able to receive, Lord, on a weekly basis, Lord, and how crucial, Lord, and important it is to our lives, Lord, and Lord, it's such a blessing, Lord, as just to be just 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 to be called your 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 um your children, Lord, and your and your your servants, Lord. Is we want to thank you so much, Lord, for just waking up today, Lord, and just guiding us throughout our days, Lord, even, and pulling us out of our moments of temptations, Lord, when we, when we yeah. feel like we're getting weak, that you, that you, that you continually call us, Lord, and you have mercy upon us, Lord. Um, we give you all the glory, honor, and the praise, Lord. We love you so much with all of our heart. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And